And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Jim Schmitz, on the topic, the problem of monopolies and the poor. Thank you very much. Okay, is are my is this what uh, is this the way it's going to go, Judy? I mean, this is great. Okay, I'm going to mute myself, and you're on. This looks good. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Judy, and uh, thank you to the Ramsey County Library for for inviting me to talk about uh, the history of monopolies and so on. Um, now, let me just <clears throat> start with a disclaimer that I, you know, I want to say that you know, these are my views. Oh. And thank you for all of you for coming. I don't know if I said that, okay. uh, but especially thank you for all for being here. Um, but the disclaimer is these are my ideas. These are my opinions that are not the opinions of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis or the Federal Reserve Board. So that's important to say. Um, before I start these slides, um, I thought I would just take a couple minutes and describe the general outline what I'm gonna do today. Um, I think it'll make it a lot easier uh, to, to, to figure out what I'm going to do. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to say is that there's going to be three main ideas that I'm going to try to um, get across. And one is that our forebears uh, in economics and philosophy and history, by which I mean, you know, those thinking about these topics in the 19th century and first half of the 20th century, um, they, they they study that they conclude that monopoly you know it was widely considered that monopolies were very uh, very uh, widespread and very harmful um, um, so that was a very widespread view and, and moreover they emphasized that uh, monopolies disproportionately hurt hurt poor people or low income people either so that's one idea and then the second idea is that today economists uh, take a very different view than that they take the view that monopolies aren't widespread. And they aren't very, they don't cause significant harm in the economy. And then the third thing I'm going to discuss is that um, I'm going to show you work that colleagues and I have been doing for the last two or three decades, um, where we find that we think our, you know, we conclude that our forebears were correct, that monopolies are widespread, they do, they do hurt the poor predominantly. So um, so let me just get, okay, but now a little bit more detail about the slides. Um, I'm gonna start with some background. Um, you might even think about it as theory. And so let me, this is gonna be, I think I spent a couple a minute on this, it'll help people. So you, you might be asking yourself, how did this happen? How did, how was it that uh, our, all our great forebears thought monopoly was a very important issue and a big problem and that, uh, um, today it's it, it, it's it, it's the it's, it's it's not an issue. So how did that happen? Well, there's probably many reasons, but one thing I want to talk consider is that well, what's is true is their definition of monopoly was very different than the definition of monopoly today. Okay, so uh, so one way is I'm, what I think is our language is failing us, um, and so ultimately, really, if you're talking about anything, you talk about X, you need to define X, and so. So really, like, what is a monopoly? I mean, that's that's actually a very hard question. And, and um, so, so the first half of the slides, about twenty slides, are going to be on that issue, and maybe a little bit abstract, but I think important. And then the second half of the slides, about twenty pages, will be uh, some of the details of the studies that we've done, um, showing what we actually, you know, the concrete evidence from today's world. That, so, do I have anything else here? No, that's it. I got Cody. Could you could you could you forward the slide? Okay, you did forward it. Thank you. So some of these slides will will, will be are things I've sort of discussed, but I think it's better that you got the whole picture. So as I said, forebears argued that monopolies were widespread and harmful and they hurt the poor. And some I've just written down a few of our forebears. Adam Smith, maybe known to some of you, he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Um, the book is considered to be 
uh, you know, the birth of economics, um, sort of. And it was a book basically written as an attack on monopoly. So I like to think of it as that when economics was born as an attack on monopoly. Then I'm just, I scoot ahead until the late 19th century with William Falwell, who some of you may know, he's a Minnesotan. Uh, he has a great history. He's an incredible person. And I'll talk about him in a little bit. And then two other people who uh, sort of my, are my heroes. Um, I have heroes that are alive too, but, but Henry Simons and Thurman Orley. And I'll talk about them a little later. Um, okay, so I think that's, I know I wanna go slow, but I think that's probably good. Okay, Cody. So um, now the, from the 1950s on to, to today, I already said that economists argue monopoly is too harmful. Now, one thing to say is, I just want to bring this up, is like, it's not that we disagreed with what they said. It's not like we said, well, you know, those studies you did were not good, or the logic of your arguments were poor. It was, we simply ignored them uh, completely. And so it's sort of, uh, well, okay, that's it. That's as simple as that. Okay, Cody. So again, how did economists reach this new conclusion that Conclusion being that monopolies were not harmful. Well, many factors likely contributed to the, this new conclusion. Obviously, hubris, uh, potentially, since we didn't even think about reading who came before us. But um, as I just as I already emphasized, we haven't we changed our we, we changed the definition. The definition changed. Again, it was not knowingly, it's not like we said they had a bad definition. We just adopted the definition. And a couple of things, to say, you know, think, one of the things to say about that is that we consider the main problem of monopoly now to be high prices. Whereas the forebears talked about that, but they talked about many, many other things that were harmful that, that uh, monopolies did. Um, and I think one of the things they did is on the next slide. So Cody, can you go to the next slide? So they talked about how monopolies sabotaged and destroyed substitute products Right. So they had a product and they were trying to develop a monopoly on it and they uh, destroyed it. I mean, this is language that Thurman Arnold, Henry Simons would use. They use this language. Uh, so um, pretty strong language, but I think it, you know, and I'll tell you how they did that. And, and I'll describe how that's going on today and how actually how their do, monopolies do that today. Um, but are on, you know, nobody's sees it. Um, and as again, it's typically the ones purchased by the poor. Okay, Cody. So I, I, I want to make sure I go slow because I usually don't go slow. And um, um, actually, I'm not seeing people as probably, it's, I wish I could see you all, but not seeing you makes me go less fast, I think, which is good. So anyway. Um, so here's Thurman Arnold. So let me just talk to a few things. Thurman Arnold was a, is a, was a great legal scholar. Um, and he went to work for Roosevelt, uh, Franklin, and as a part of the New Deal. And he's one of the New Deal uh, brainiacs or brain trust people. Or, um, but before that, he was, you know, was taught at Yale and had some very influential books, which are still taught today in law schools. Um, but then he went to the Department of Justice uh, uh, Roosevelt asked him to be the head of antitrust at DOJ, and um, so he was a bit of controversial pick, but he turned out to be an incredible pick. Um, he was worked from 38, 1938 to 1943, a very long period. Uh, so this is during that period, period when he was at the DOJ, and, and he and this is just a quote uh, from Arnold about uh, monopolies in the poor. And it was given, the, the speech was giving, given in Madison. Um, and it was in tribute memorial for Robert La Follette, who many of you may know. Um, he was called Robert Fighting Bob La Follette for, for fighting monopolies. Um, you know, he, he passed away in 1925. So to give you some idea of his, his life period. But um, so you can see what Arnold said. Arnold said, we found that our United States our United States only expansion had been a luxury. So this is, he's looking back 
on the depression. And he's saying, you know, the only expansion we had was in luxuries. Following the fundamental, fundamental axiom that in a monopoly economy, luxuries expand while the necessities of life contract. And so implicitly he's saying, during the depression, we had a monopoly economy. And again, a lot of people put a lot of the, Simons would say that. So anyway, um, okay. So that, again, Simon, oh, uh, he's, he's my hero, this guy. Okay, but I want, okay. So, um, okay, um, uh, Cody, let's go to the next one. Okay, so in 19, colleagues and myself uh, in 1980, starting in 1980 and still going, that arrow keeps drifting over to the right, but that's supposed to be back in your 1980. Um, we, you know, we were wondering, you know, are monopolies, do they really inflict little harm? You know, I started grad school in 1980. That's where the, that number comes from. And, you know, when I first started hearing this, I was like, mm, wow, I, I, you know, that surprises me. I didn't know any, you know, I never took a course on monopolies in, as an undergrad or anything, but just having read newspapers, and so on, um, it seemed like they may have been a, a trouble. Anyway, well, we didn't know about Thurman Arnold. We didn't know about Henry Simons. We didn't know about William Falwell. So, you know, we just started working and we actually were making some progress. And, and, and you know, we, in the last few decades, we, we, you know, we've been finding just what our forebears said, that they were harmful or they hurt the poor. So just to give you an indication where I, we, we've been in this whole process. Um, okay, I'm hopefully I'm going slow enough. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, um, Cody, let's go to the next one. So it was about five years ago that we discovered our forebears, and it was extremely, you know, extremely thankful and happy to find them, right? So it was like we had some uh, people who have our backs because, you know, this is very different uh, to what's going on in economics. And so usually it's not, it's, you know, anyway, whatever. We were thankful and not only for their great work, but for, but also as mentors. I mean, just the way these people went about their business, very honest, sincere, uh, uh, you know, I could go on, but anyway, very, very, very uh, people you could admire a lot. Oh, and, and we get to fall on that. Look, here, here's Falwell now. I, I have a little bit of his body. Listen to this guy, William Falwell. Um, he fought, I'm going to start later. He fought in the Civil War. After the Civil War, he became a math professor at Kenyon College for a couple of years. Then he became the first president of the University of Minnesota in 1869 at age 36. And he served from 1869 to 1884. Uh, toward the end of that period, he played a big role in the formation of the American Economic Association, which was just forming at that time, which is, you know, the premier uh, association in economics. So he was he was part of that group that formed that. Um, uh, then he became chairman of the political economy department at the University of Minnesota. So when he left the president, he became chairman of political economy from 1884 to 1907. And then there's a whole list of things he did in public service. He was he was on crucial in, in, in establishing the uh, public high school system, the Minneapolis park system. Anyway, um, so this so let me just go to the next. So, so speaking for myself and not my colleagues, th these our forebears, you know, these individuals. I like to say, you know, they they forgot more about monopoly in a day than I know about monopoly. Okay, so I just want to let people know how deep a knowledge of monopoly they had that. I don't know if you, I, this, I like this saying, I mean, I might not have written, written out well, but it's, there's a saying like that. Okay, Cody, on to the next one. Uh, so here's the outline of the remainder of the talk. I mean, you know, I'm going to go over the current definition of monopoly. I'm going to go over forebears definition. I'm going to show how the current definition is failing us in the sense there's lots of monopolies that we don't see because we're using this definition that is uh, poor in my opinion, okay. um, of course, because the definition, we choose what we want, but I, 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 the one today is, is, is horrendous, in my opinion. Okay, um, I guess go to the next one, please, Cody. 
So this is a definition. You'll find it in all textbooks, undergrad textbooks, graduate textbooks. You'll find it in academic papers. A monopoly is a firm that is the sole seller of a product without close substitutes. Okay. Um, okay, that's it. Okay. Um, Forty. let's go to the next slide. Yeah, following this definition, again, the analysis about, you know, how costly a monopoly may be or how bad it is, usually it very invariably it just talks about the monopoly, how the monopoly chooses the price and is how how bad is that for society? Um, so that's you know, so it's it's a it's a firm with with no sells sole sell of a product. Okay, Cody, one another one. Uh, so so it's I want to, well, I'll show you that I think it's extremely narrow, you know, I mean, what firms in fact satisfy this definition, you know, <laughs> none of the firms you might think of Google, Amazon, Facebook satisfy it, for example, you know, often the definition will be extended to say, oh, okay, well, firms which have a large market share, uh, uh, well, that's, I think it, that, that, not, a, anyway, that, that's, a, that leads to trouble and I won't, maybe I'll get to some of that, I don't, that does nothing for me. I don't think it's a good definition to, or a good way to go. I think some of that will come out in this talk. Okay, Cody. Um, so again, forebears, okay. So this is gonna be a little, okay. I'm sorry, these slides not be, might not be perfectly placed, but here, what are forebears? They knew. They knew that many organizations besides firms are single sellers with no close substitutes and has substantial control over price, okay? So we go back to that definition where we have firm there, uh, you know, we can take that out and just what, you know, a monopoly is an organization that's a sole seller product with no close substitutes and has control over price, okay? So, I mean, just that alone is a big improvement because we look, we, we can see, I mean, there's no reason to limit ourselves to firms, right? No logical reason because there's no, I don't think that's uh, an arguable or that's something that needs to, to be argued about. Okay. okay, so, and then here's the other, now here's the other thing. Many of these organizations achieve this status as sole sellers by destroying substitutes for their products. Okay, it, it, you know, they didn't, you know, sometimes people get a patent. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking, you know, so if you get a patent, okay, you may, could be a sole seller and you got to be through research. But I'm talking about when the political system is used or violence is used or disinformation is used. Um, and that happens all the time. Okay. Okay. And as I said, these features are not captured by the current definition. Okay, Cody. Okay, so I'm gonna go over. Yeah, I should probably pick it up. Okay, I know I'm gonna go over an example here. It's it's like a it's like a model, it's like an abstraction, uh, that comes from an actual experience of of traditional builders of homes that build homes outside using craft methods, have blocked factory homes in the United States for the last hundred years. Okay. Um, and so, so this, this is an example, okay, to show you of uh, an organization which is a sole seller of a product, which has control over price and did it by sabotaging a substitute. So let's suppose, and I have a few symbols here, which may be, um, okay, which may be, um, that's fine, let's, we'll just go. So suppose X is housing services produced with traditional methods so good X is produced in an area with a large number of firms, hundreds. Initially, suppose that's the only way to produce housing services. And suppose that the goods, those who produce it form good X, uh, form a trade association. Of course, this, this, the producers of this good now as a group, the trade association are the sole sellers of X. Everybody who's, the, we can think of them, they're the sole sellers. Okay, Cody. Um, okay, so imagine a new good is developed making how producing housing services with factory built homes say good why um 
This is a substitute for X and is likely to replace good X. It's a much better product, okay? Um, you know, um, anyway, certainly building smaller homes. Uh, so it's, it, it, all right, so. Now the trade association can marshal its resources to attempt to sabotage this product. And it has lots of potential weapons, which have been used, right? Legislation saying, you, you know, outlawing these things. Regulation, getting, you know, getting the government to, to regulate against it. Misinformation, uh, deceit. There's many weapons. Okay, Cody, okay. Um, now, can, can a trade association, that's what TA means, can that convince individual members to contribute resources? Now, this is because the economists say, look, if you have a firm with a thousand employees that is, that's a sole seller, I mean, that's very different than a trade association with a thousand members. How are you going to get them to contribute? Thomas think have a term free rider, right? Suppose there's a thousand firms and we ask, you know, we ask them all to contribute monies for the lobbying effort. Well, if I'm one of those firms, I'm going to say, well, whether I contribute or not means absolutely nothing to how much is in total is going to be raised, or, you know, roughly. So I'm not going to do it. So we kind of say, well, you know, these, this can't happen, but, um, you know, it does happen. I mean, many organizations have overcome these issues. You have peer pressure, you have shame and other things. Anyway, if you look at history, they do get over by this. Okay, Cody. So, you know, suppose a trade association now through its lobbying is able to block good why. Um, forget the next two lines. So the idea is that um, they block good why. Good why can't be used like it can't be in a lot of places in this country, factory homes. So now, uh, so we have control over price, obviously, because we, you know, there's a price for our surf, our houses now, and, and it, it, that's positive. And if we hadn't blocked it, we would be gone. So we're, you know, our price would have been zero. So we have a control, very significant control over price, obviously. Um, and we became a single seller because we got rid of the, the, the potential threat to us. All right, Cody, let's go. I'm, I, 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 I was too slow for a while. Okay, so let me just say. This 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 is like um, this is like uh, okay, but it's clear, right? If if you're a builder that makes traditional homes, you say there's competition. Of course, there's competition, right? There's free entry. People can come in and build homes a traditional way. There's in some sense there's competition, but it's not you know in some sense. But there's really not competition in this industry in that in the sense that we blocked and destroyed a product that the industry should be producing. And so that's where like people using the current definition, I'm getting ahead of myself, right? The people using the current definition, economists, the top economists in the country, they say, look, this is a competitive, you know, they don't consider a possibility of monopoly in the industry because there's so many firms, it's so competitive, but they completely miss uh, what our forebears knew. Our forebears knew this, what I'm talking about. Okay, Cody. Um, okay, look, now I'm going to, I'm finishing up the theory part, okay? So this is like, remember I said, okay, I said I was gonna talk about the forebears definition. Well, let me give you just a few details about this. They acknowledge, they said, you know what? It's really hard to define monopoly. A definition is an abstraction. And it's difficult to find a good abstraction when monopolies are so widespread, they're doing so many things. There's so many different types of organizations. There's so many weapons they use. So how do you actually do that? Okay. So next, Cody. Uh, so let me just say, I'm not even gonna put up a definition or, I mean, I'm gonna give you something, but anyway. Uh, again, Thurman Arnold had a definition. He wrote down an organization is a, you know, that does these things as a monopoly. And he had like seven things, right? So he said, direct, you know, directly, if you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you know, you're a monopoly. It's a beautiful way to think about it. And, and we don't have to have his list. We can have it shorter, we can have it longer, but it's a beautiful way to think about it, right? Um, so on that list, he could say, if you block a technology or you sabotage your product, um, again, it's just beautiful. And so I'm not gonna um, give you his definition or it, it is, it's seven, it, it's long. So that's, I mean, you want your definition, you know, the current definition is, uh, I don't know, eight words. You know, <laughs> this is like eight points. So, but, you know, not is a bad thing. We can take time to read it. Okay, Cody, let's go to the next one. 
But one potential definition of monopoly, this is something I just wrote down based on what our forebears did is like a monopoly is an organization that is the sole seller of a product without close substitutes, right? So even that first sentence, just, I'm not sure if you can, if I can erase, you know, even that first sentence is a huge improvement on the current definition. And then we can add another sentence. Many of these organizations achieve the status by sabotaging substitutes. And typically, we could add another one. Okay, so that would be a definition that would be monstrously better than the current one, in my opinion. Okay, next one, Cody. And again, many different organizations satisfy this definition of being a monopoly. You know, trade associations, professional associations, government organizations, informally organized groups, right? The groups that oppose black voting, I mean, a lot of these groups were, in, you know, they were informally organized, but they all knew what, what, what they were after, right? So it wasn't even, you could even name who's in the monopoly, but they're, right? Some of this is being stre is stretching the definition, but it's, I can talk about more. I won't talk about that now, but, um, and so I'm gonna talk about builders as I've been talking about later. And I'm gonna talk about dentists later. So, but I just wanna let, let you know all the dentists in the audience and all the builders in the audience, if there are any that we, we all, all of us, economists included, uh, are involved with monopolies. And moreover, we may be members of monopolies and not know it. I mean, we, um, uh, okay, okay, let's go, Cody. Okay, so, um, so, so I'm gonna talk about monopolies blocking factory housing. Remember I talked about the trade association. There's a trade association today that's very powerful and is involved in blocking. But there's many monopolies. It's a perfect storm. There's many, many groups that don't want factory housing. The trade unions, the local contractors, the building inspectors. The building inspectors don't want it. They want it. They don't want one type of factory that's inspected, inspected in the factory. Um, so there's monopolies all over the place. Um, so Cody, can we go to the next page? So this is a this is an advertisement from, is it the Tribune? Yeah, it's the Chicago Tribune, September 6th, 1921. So um, there, there, was a, there was a war going on in the construction industry between uh, different monopolies, trade unions, local contractors, which had a monopoly, the uh, materials producers. You couldn't, you couldn't buy any materials except those made in Chicago at the time. So there was all, and so Judge Keensaw Mountain Landis, who some of you may know, famous character. Anyway, he 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 um, he agreed to to arbitrate these disputes. And one thing he did was he was trying to make the system much more efficient, and so on and so forth. And one thing he said was, uh, it was thought. I'm not sure that that you know he's saying we're not allowed to have factory homes. Uh, shipped into Chicago. So this this is one thing that was hoped to be changed. So in 19 so in 1921, this this is an advertisement from Gordon Van Tyne Company. It's a it's a producer of factory homes in uh, Davenport, Iowa. And so they put this ad in the paper the next day after the arbitration decision and said, look, you can buy factory homes now in um oh I'm sorry. That's fine. It's is this okay now? Somebody says like I'm moving about too much. Yeah, that should that should be okay. I'm sorry. How much was missed? Sorry. <laughs> I think you're I think you're all right to keep going. Yeah. Okay. All right. So all right. So okay. Uh yeah, sorry. Okay, let's let's. Okay, so so you can see that, um, um, you you can see that factory homes were blocked in Chicago, and 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 Judge Landis was trying to get them back in, and this company thinks it's going to happen. I'm not sure if it did happen. You know, obviously, uh, there's a lot of violence back then, and not clear what happened. But anyway, they were blocked. Okay, can you can you go back, Cody, to the previous page? Okay, so now, um, 
Now, here's a case in 1941 where the Department of Justice, remember Thurman Arnold was there, um, brought this case against uh, monopolies attacking prefabricators. So a first step in the protection of the prefabricator was taken in September 1940 by an indictment which charges a conspiracy to prevent the sale of prefabricated houses in Belleville, Illinois. Local building materials dealers, contractors, locals to the carpenters and building laborers union, and the chief of police are charged with a series of efforts to prevent the erection of a prefabricated house by concerted refusals to perform the work and by violence to prevent others from performing it. Okay, so as I said, it's like a perfect storm. And, and so each one of these little groups have their own monopoly, but they have a super monopoly too when they all join together. Um, you know, they leave. Okay. All right, Cody, one more, please. Uh, yeah, and, and one more again. And so this now is a picture from Look Magazine's cover uh, that um, Thurman, it's, this is a Thurman article, a, a Thurman Arnold article written by, for Look Magazine. And um, uh, this is after he left DOJ in 1947. And the caption, it's hard to read, but it says this specific Pacific War veteran and his family are homeless because we have let rackets, chiseling, and feather bedding, feather bedding block the production of low cost housing. Okay, so Cody, can we go to the next slide? And this is from that article from, by Thurman Arnold. Why can't we have houses like Ford's? For a long time, we have been hearing about mass production of marvelously efficient post-war dream houses, all manufactured in one place and distributed like Ford's. Yet nothing is happening. The low cost mass production house has bogged down, bogged down. Why? The answer is this. When Henry Ford went into the automobile business, he only had one organization to fight. But when a Henry Ford of housing tries to get into the market with a dream house for the future, he doesn't find just one organization blocking him. Lined up against him are a ser staggering series of restraints and protective tariffs. Um, okay, Cody. So, so this is so okay. So, so this is this is still happening, right? This is still happening. So, we're still blocking the production of factory homes in this country. Okay, you know, 100 years after Judge Landis uh, tried to stop, you know, issued his arbitration order. Um, but something has changed. I mean, what's changed is the Congress don't know about it. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like, it seems like it's impossible, right? Either I'm crazy. It seems, it seems like there's two choices, right? I'm, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm crazy has to be on the table. Maybe there's more than two choices. Um, yeah, that's, I don't know what probability you want to put out of that, but anyway, it's still happening and economists don't see it. And again, because we've changed the definition, they're looking, they see a lot of competition among traditional builders. They see they don't make great profits. When people think of monopoly, they think of big, big profits. There's no profits. So, okay, Cody. Um, so let me just show you, during the 1960s, factory built home share of single family home source I mean, factory homes are a very low cost way to make homes. So you could think at some point they're gonna get, try to get over this resistance to them being produced. And they did for a while. So in the 1960s, the share of factory production in total production, where total production is right, factory plus stick built, it went from 10% to 60% in the 60s. And basically where the whole action was, factory homes were producing, were taking over the market for small, lower priced homes. Because a factory, actually a factory, is, it's, it has an advantage over stick, but as big as it's relative, it's as big as advantage is improving small homes. So the future of building traditionally was, was bleak. So can we go to the next slide? So, what I, what I have here is, um, this is the production of small modular homes over time. 
And on the left-hand side is hundreds of thousands of units. And you can see it's passes around about 100 until 60. And then, you know, for reasons I could tell you, but it's, it starts to soar, it goes up to 600,000 units. And then it crashes dramatically. Now there's this bump up and that's because of, you know, they, th this, these, this market had a no doc lending boom before, you know, the 2008 one. So they, they were, you know, giving homes away. So, okay. So why this fell, why this happened was because of monopoly. It was HUD, housing and, U, housing and urban development, working together with the trade association of the builders called the National Association of Film Builders, working together, devising ways to kill the smart, to kill the industry. Okay. Um, Cody, can we go to, go to the first next slide? Okay, so one, okay, so, so one way they did it is HUD gave massive subsidies to those purchasing a, a home made traditionally. So if you buy, bought a home made traditionally, you could get a mortgage at 1% when it was 8% otherwise. Okay. And HUD introduces legislation in 1974. I'll tell you, it's part of it. One aspect is like, it, it required that these homes have a chassis and not take the chassis off once it's, the, once it's delivered. So sometimes delivering a home on a chassis is the cheapest way to deliver that home. But the 19, by the 1970s, they're delivering these homes to their sites and they're taking the chassis off and they're putting on a foundation. This legislation required that they keep the chassis on when they put it on a foundation, right? Absolutely shocking. Okay, can you go, Cody, can you go to the next slide? So there we have an example of one of these homes, you know, the chassis sitting inside one, a basement. Uh, Cody, can you go with the next one? Here's another example, okay? This, <laughs> this is really a disaster for the industry, right? Can you go back now too, or yeah? There, I, thank you. And now the other thing is that they adopted, they adopted a national building code. Now, can you go ahead three, Cody? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, those who know anything about factory homes, it's all, they, okay, they, they developed a national building code for small modular homes. So if anybody who studied factory homes, it's like, oh, building factory homes is not um, economical because you have to build for one town and then you go to the other town and it's, and the code changes. So, you know, you're, you have to stop your production line and, and change all the things in the production line and just, oh, this really reduces the, the efficiency of the factory. So they said, oh, we're gonna have a national building code. So the code is the same for all places. Okay, sounds great, right? And, um, but it's, it's not because it was not because you need all the builders in the country to face that code. So let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you what I mean. And, and people don't get this still. So where did traditional builders compete with the factory? They were competing with them and typically mostly with like small towns, maybe small cities, rural areas, okay? In these areas, the local builders often face no building. Okay, so, so I'm gonna, I'm a, I, so if I put on a, a national building code for factory builders, which is actually a pretty strict code. So I'm, before the, before this law, I'm competing with, you know, factory people and, and local people, local uh, traditional builders are competing, but there's no code. So that, you know, they, they just, whatever the customer wants, they, they agree, whatever, so on and forth. But now I have, to, I as a factory producer have to put, follow this really strict code. So it devastated them. So, so that's why uh, that happened. Okay, Cody, let's go. Thank you. And so, you know, I'm just putting quotes on like I sort of already, Presaged. That, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, you know, is it, these are quotes from, I think their names out, you know, the top economists in housing, top, top, top departments. And they're like, you know, housing is applied to many, many people. You know, it's very competitive. You know, there's so, no, there's no barriers to entry. Anybody can enter. 
profits are low. I'm sorry to bounce around. Okay, so as I said, economists don't see this. I guess what's more disappointing, actually, when I explain it to housing economists, sometimes they're not interested. And then I actually see that they're in charge of, well, well, this is true, I can say it, and I won't tell you the names, but you know, in charge of uh, institutes that are getting funded by NH NAHP and HUD. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, Cody. Okay. I don't know if I want to get into this, but look, look, you might close your eyes in here, but like, it's like, well, how much would this really help our country if we allowed factory producers to produce really small modular homes, which you can build of high quality for 50 or $60,000. They're small homes. They're a thousand square feet, but they're high quality because they're built to this code. So how much is that really going to, because you, you can't put one, you know, you can't put one of those in a city, right? Everybody, when they think of affordable housing, often it's like we're talking about Minneapolis or St. Paul. So you're not going to put one of these things in a city, right? Because you know that the cities sort of block these things, block nice houses anyway, right? So what do you, I mean, how much does it matter? Well, the point is that it's going to allow people to build new cities or smaller cities or go to the small towns where, where people, uh, companies are trying to hire people, but there's no cheap housing, right? Because you have, the construction is very expensive. So you might, you know, you could buy an acre of land in some of these small towns or $10,000. And, and um, I mean, do you see what I mean? It's like, anyway, I, I'm i sort of picking it up here because I, I want to, anyway, so I think it would make a big difference. I think people could move out of, you know, I think poor people are often trapped in cities. Um, I mean, there's a literature like, why, why do poor people live in cities? And they say, oh, it's because of good transportation. I think it's, it's, it, it's hard to move. You move out to a small place. Um, jobs aren't good. And how are you going to afford a house? Even though land is cheap, you have to pay the construction costs, which is extremely high because you're using these traditional methods. So, all right, next one, Cody. Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to do the oral health system now. Uh, so the American Dental Association is a very, very strong professional association, and it has long blocked low cost substitute. Okay, so I've, you know, there's a lot of research done on this, and so I, I will skip that actually, and I will even I will talk about how uh, the ADA even attacks other dentists. You know, maybe maybe their own members. Um. So. Um, Cody, we'll go to the next one. Thank you. So again, this will be no surprise to Thurman Arnold. I mean, two of the seven points above where I'm listing here, they, meaning monopolies, set up an arbitrary and despotic control over production and exploit weaker members of their own group. Okay, this is incredible. It's like, you know, I've been studying monopolies for 30 years and I see this all the time and like, or, or like after he said it, I put it together. I mean, I, I forget exactly who won't, but you know, I would just read this stuff and I was like, my God, so much was clear to me. And so I'm, I think I forget the timing area, but anyway, thank God for Thurman Arnold. So, okay. Um, now, one reason they do that is because they, you know, they stop monopoly stop the introduction of new and more efficient methods in order to maintain absolute ways of production. Okay, let me give you let me give you a situation where that happened. Cody, could you go to the next one? So Sorrell Dentistry. This, this I'm taking. I've done. You know, this is come, comes from June Thomas and Slate, um, my good friend. Uh, I forget his name. He sent it to me a number of years ago. It was great. I mean, Todd Smalley. Okay, but anyway, um, uh, so. Sorrell Dentistry is an innovative dental group in Alabama, and it saw a great need for oral health care among low-income children in Alabama because low-income children often, I mean, their, their, their dental health is, is extremely bad, typically. Um, they get funding from Medicare, I, I forget, they get some public funding, but it's very, the rates are very, reimbursement rates are very low. And so, 
often they can't get dentists to accept their insurance or they live where dentists don't, ex you know, don't, they're not even our dentists, okay? So Terrell's idea was we're gonna achieve high volumes of care and even at low reimbursement rates, we, we can have a successful model, okay? So like a factory, <laughs> I mean, I, you know. And so they did this by opening clinics um, oop, I just saw Ann McKinsey. Sorry. I have some ideas about that. Um, <laughs> anyway, let me keep going. So, um, um, so I'm going to go to 1:30 if that's okay. Anyway, I, I'm almost done. Um, but, um, okay. So they saw how they could serve these children. And also, you know, make you know, make a going of it. Uh, and then I just said they they achieved it by opening clinics where dentists had not been available, having many dental chairs and keeping the chairs in use most of the day. Okay. So as Thomas stated, Sorrell provides the poorest children in the poorest counties of a poor state with top quality dental care. Okay, Cody, can we go to the next? So, but they, be, they, they were attacked by the Alabama Dental Association. Uh, they argued that Sorrell broke laws and how a dental clinic could be operated. And of course, these are laws that limit competition, how, how, how big your clinic can be or who could own a dental practice, uh, many different laws uh, are on the books. But they, they, they actually, after a long fight, they were able to keep going in Alabama. Cody, go to the next one. So when Sorrell was later, you know, it, it tried to move into adjacent states, but those dental associations were able to keep them out, right? So, so, um, so the benefit Sorrell's care was denied these low-income children in these adjacent states. I don't know if there's any, this would be an incredible way to study to do you know, to look in these other states and compare how their low-income children are being treated to, to Alabama. I mean, if anybody is interested in uh, that, you want to do that, that, you can talk to me. I'll, I'm willing to help. I mean, I just don't have time to do this stuff, but um, it would be, be great. Okay. Okay, so Cody. Oh, okay, let's go. Can you go back? Sorry, I have an introduction to that yellow piece of paper. So, um, so I'm going to trans. This is my transition to the telegram. So, I haven't said anything about Henry Simons. So, Henry Simons was a professor at the University of Chicago in the 30s and early 40s, and he was also one of the um, great thinkers about monopoly, along with Thurman Arnold's. And um, um, uh, he wrote a book review about Thurman Arnold's book, which was called Bottlenecks of Business. And it was put out in like 41 and it was trying to um, galvanize support for his antitrust work. And Simons, you know, was talking, oh, he was angry that, um, Arnold wouldn't like limit, like consider legislation to limit the size of firms and so on. So he's much more, uh, uh, he wanted monopolies to be more and more uh, restricted or, or just, he was very worried about monopolies. So, and then at some point in the book review, he said, um, I don't even know if I trust this guy, Arnold, you know I mean? If I knew he was trying his hardest, but, but you know, if I knew he was, his heart was clean and, the reason why he's not doing some of these things is because he, he's, he doesn't have, you know, the, the political backing to do it. Um, I wish I knew that, you know, because I can't trust him right now. And, you know, a few more sentences later in the paragraph, he goes, I'm going to trust the whole. I mean, I mean, I don't read anything like that in economics and it's sort of like set your, puts sort of fire in your belly. It's, it's the way you would write. And so, um, but um, I have a few minutes, but let me let me just read the last paragraph of that book review. 
uh, I think you get an idea of Henry Simons. Um, and it's hard to understand actually, because he writes like an old guy, uh, well, old way. But anyway, let me just read this paragraph. If I belabor him, Arnold, for being unduly preoccupied with a short view and unmindful of long run considerations like legislation, I do this mainly for the purpose of raising questions, which I think should be discussed at least in academic circles, questions which Arnold would be unwise to raise if he wanted to. He has already been contagious, uh, courageous, to the verge of folly. He has said more and spoken more candidly than would be appropriate if he were wholly concerned about his own political survival. If the political finesse of his words and actions make it hard for trade union and trade association leaders to liquidate, it, liquidate him, his transparent zeal and purpose also make it easy. If he has not escaped defeat, he has assured that it will, it will be rather glorious if it comes. Anyway, I'll stop there, but he was, I mean, so he's, he just praises of, so, he, okay. So, he, so now I, um, so a couple, couple of weeks before the, like a month before the, um, the pandemic hit in November of 2019, I, I went to visit my mother-in-law in Fort Collins, E.D. Thompson. And while I was there, I was able to make a trip up to Thurman Arnold's archives at the University of Wyoming. And of course, I was dying to know how much more I could learn about Henry Simons there and Thurman Arnold and maybe their relationship. So, I mean, I would love to have transcripts of what they talked about. So anyway, but I didn't find much so I'm going to go back, but I did find one thing, and the the thing I found is what that yellow piece of paper is. So I get, Cody, can we see that telegram? So the telegram is sent to Mr. Henry Simons at the Quadrangle Club at Chicago, which is like the place where you can play pool. Actually, that's what <laughs> on the campus. And it was sent from. It was sent from Arnold. It was sent from, yeah, from Arnold to Simons. And then what it said is, wire me time of your arrival. Want you to go to cocktail party with me if possible. Well, doing research is fun, but this is some of the most fun I've ever had <laughs> reading that telegram. I knew there was only one thing um, um, in, 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 the, in the archive that I could find it quickly, but I found this and so, um, I didn't scream or, or raise my voice because it was a, but I came close and I think my fists were raised. And so, so these guys were good friends, um, it seems. Um, and you can see that he actually paid for it, how things have changed, right? He, it's a personal. And the date, uh, my, that was my mother's birthday. So she was like 10 years old that day. So April 4th, 1941. So. Anyway, it was a very, very exciting experience. So, okay. Well, let me just, I have a, let me just conclude then. Um, you know, I haven't mentioned like Facebook or Apple or Intel and so on and so forth. Those are the names we hear today when people think about monopolies. And I think we should be worried about them. Uh, you know, Arnold and Simons were very worried about them in terms of well, large enterprises, particularly about their threat to democracy. Um, and so, and, and of course, they wrote about cartels and how the cartels in the United States had uh, worked with Hitler, I mean, the cartels in, in Germany. And so they talked about how these cartels had a foreign policy of their own. And so they were extremely worried. Um, and of course, that that's that's true today. I mean, you know, we look at, um, I think it's Apple. Apple's like giving China technology so they can, um, um, you know, follow follow people better, attract people better. I mean, so it's, do we want Apple? I mean, that's a that seems like a foreign policy issue, doesn't it? That we want. So, do we want to make it easy for China to to be able to follow their citizens? I mean, that seems, and you know. Intel told China about a flaw in, the, in its chip design before it told the United States. Um, 
I don't know, I go on and on. I mean, I just, but I'm just saying th there's very good reasons to worry about um, some of these characters. And, and again, it's not because of price, it's, it's other things. Okay. Um, but, the, but, but what my colleagues and I have been talking about is like, this is, we're talking, we want to, we want to make clear that there's monopolies out there that are unrecognized. And, oh, I should say, who are the people worried about these big firms? Well, they're the people who are doing pretty well in our country, right? They're, we're, we're the ones who democracy serves well. So, I mean, democracy hasn't served low income people as well. Um, and so, you know, you see how housing that the poor would be, would buy being built, being blocked for a hundred years. And we don't even, now we don't even know what's happening um, so the point is there's so many monopolies that are harming the poor that are not recognized and, um, it's because the, they don't have the political power. I don't, you know, just as an example. So last thing I'm going to say is I've been mentioning my colleagues, so I, I should mention them by name, but I probably forget a lot of them, but anyway, like, um, you know, I worked with Tom Holmes, um, Tim Dunn, Ben Bridgman, Shur Chi, Mark Wright, and Arlton Texera, just a few that I wrote down here, but okay, well, I hope I didn't hope I hope that, uh, didn't speak too fast. Thank you. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, Jim Schmitz. Uh, we are now ready for questions. Uh, and I see that we do have a number of questions already, but I believe we have room for some more. Uh, I will just say to our audience again, uh, please put your question in the Q&A column, not the chat line. Uh, if I see them in the Q&A column, then I read them in order and uh, that's the fairest thing for everyone. So I'll start right in. Um, first question, uh, how is Facebook not a monopoly? You said early on that Facebook, um, um, I think Microsoft, uh, Amazon, none of those were monopolies. And this well, person again, asked, you know, why is that? <laughs> well, using the current definition of monopoly, that common comments have a firm as as a sole seller of a product. So you can't, you know, I guess how you that depends how you define product. If you say, so if you think about, well, let's say Google, and you think about advertising on search search engines right well google probably maybe accounts for i don't know 90 percent or 80 percent of that market but um so in that sense it's not it's 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 not the sole seller so i very much think you know i'm not so i'm not saying facebook is not a monopoly i was saying in the context of the way e-commerce think about monopoly it's not and as i just said in the conclusion i mean if it sets her, and let me just go back, what is a monopoly? And, and I think the definition should include potentially Facebook. So I, I, I hope that's clear. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, Facebook, then the, 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 Myanmar, wasn't there a big, uh, Rohingya in Myanmar were, were slaughtered because of Facebook's, uh, uh, whatever they do. But, but I mean, there's all the, the Facebook, but right. That, I guess that's all I can say, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll put that down to definitional, uh, uh, what, definitional? Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna argue that Facebook is not a monopoly. Okay, all right. Blame the definition, not the issue. Okay, uh, is sabotaging substitutes somehow different than buying up the substitutes? I think of the big three who bought patents for car improvements and then buried those patents in file cabinets. Uh, that's that's a very good point, and it's it's you know it's the same thing. Um, there's mm -hmm. actually a paper recently written um, in economics called "Killer Acquisitions," <laughs> with that same idea. So no, that's that's um, that's exactly right, and uh, that's exactly right. Okay, um, and maybe there are some more recent uh, examples of uh, situations like that where where uh, current monopolies uh, have sort of 
stifled uh, innovation through acquisition. Is that so? Can you think of? Yeah. Uh, well, to be very honest, um, I spend most of my time thinking about these ones that are harm, you know, the, the, about building and about okay. lawyers and about, I mean, this, you know, sure. I don't think too much about that, but I, um, but let me just say, that is a big idea. Do monopolies, do monopolies, uh, it, you know, do they innovate or something or, or, well, anyway, let me just say when a monopoly blocks a substitute product, you're blocking all the innovation that would happen in that substitute product. And it's, you know, so it, it's, it, you know, it's destroying all this innovation that would occur in factory homes or in these ways to provide services to poor children. Um, you know, you just, if you just stop that industry, it's gone, there's no research. So, um, um, so, so I, don't, I, I don't really follow. <laughs> okay, all yeah. right. Um, in the last 20 years, what are some examples of how monopoly advocates have lobbied political parties in the United States? Um, well, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's continuous. I mean, for example, I haven't talked about lawyers yet, but there's, there's things called unauthorized practice of law statutes which say that nobody can give legal advice uh, of any kind, no matter how trivial, whether paid or unpaid, if they haven't passed the bar exam. Okay. And so um, now that's been around for quite a while. You know, that started in, um, um, you know, that was in the 30s and earlier, but, but I mean, but it comes up once in a while. And, and, and so the lawyers have their lobbyists to make sure that nobody tries to get rid of these statutes, right? So, and the dentists have, the, have, have lobbying, that's at the state level, right? So you have those things. Um, well, and again, I saw somebody talk about pharmaceuticals, right? I mean, I guess, I mean, again, there's, that's something which I do thought about a little and studied. Of course, pharmaceuticals have incredible lobbying, right? We're, Supposedly, um, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, the woman senator from Arizona who dresses very well or, or flashy. I mean, um, supposedly, like she has turned over her, you know, she she's been co-opted by the pharmaceutical industry, and um, so that's a big one. The farm, and and then the opiate. How, though, you know, what happened with the opiate crisis and 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 the. Sackler family and how they lobbied and how they, I mean, I, you're, everybody, many people in the audience probably remember uh, the, the, the Dalcon Shield cases in Minnesota in the 60s. And do you remember, Judy, do you remember his name, Judge? Uh, I'm not from Minnesota, but I definitely remember the Dalcon Shield uh, controversy. But he, uh, but I'm not from Minnesota, I'm sorry. He, no, there was a very famous judge. Why can't I think of his name? Who who um, who you know wrote about that? And I, I was hoping that I don't know if they used that in the, in, in this opiate case, but um, oh man, what, but yeah, thank you very much, Judge Miles Ward. Okay. Yes. <laughs> thank no. You. Thank you. He he. They took him off the case because he was pushing so hard, and. He, so he said, I'll get off the case if the people from Richmond who, who ran the Dalcon Shield come to Minnesota and I want to talk to him. So they came and like his speech, the first few lines of his speech he had, but he, his wife made him cross him out. But the first line was like, rise, you sons of bitches. So excuse <laughs> me, I'm, I'm sure, I'm not sure if that's, if I crossed the line there, but that was, that's Miles Lord. He, he was a battler and he fought the, he fought, you know, anyway, he was, um, so, so that's been going on. Um, you know, and he wrote a, a great law review article, you know, the crime, the crime without any uh, people guilty, like corporate crime. I mean, just, you know, we, 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 go, we go through the 1980, we go through the 
2008 um, crisis, housing crisis in there. Nothing happens to anybody. You know, we, we have a we have many more questions, and then we're kind of running low on time. Okay. So why don't we just uh, steam forward and see how many that we can get to? Um, this questioner says. Uh, Levittown in post-war uh, Long Island is a perfect example, uh, presumably, of a monopoly, a uh, housing monopoly. Did you want to talk about that? Oh, I'm not sure what sense he or she means about that, but Levittown, yeah, it was built, well, it was built to try to build homes. For, I mean, it, it was, it was, um, you know, what they, way they built homes is, is like, it was like a factory outside. And so, Mm -hmm. You just lot, you you build ten homes in a block, and, and the engineer, you know, the electricians would move from house to house to house and wire them, and so it, it saves a lot of money. But then um, they real the Lev the Levitts the, that's who Levittown's mm -hmm. name for. They actually just they just you know as the sixties went on, they they started in the forties. As the sixties went on, they realized, look, uh, we can't be factory built methods, and so. During the 60s, when the factories started taking off, they said, um, you know, they just got out of the business because they said, look, if we, I had quotes, you know, they say, look, if we, if we really, if the only possible way to house people in, in a decent, reasonable way, the whole population is in a factory. I mean, and they just closed down. So I, it doesn't sound like I'm answering that person's question, but I know a lot about Levittown and, and, and the history of it. and, mm -hmm. and um, they lost, they, they, okay, that's all I can say. Yeah. I think maybe the questioner was referring to um, pre-1960s uh, instances of uh, attempts, Bramie, at um, oh, don't, monopoly don't, don't, and housing, because he also goes on to say, Sears Roebuck sold building plans and provided materials for individuals to build their own houses back before the 1900s. Right, right. So, yeah, so he, this, this person was saying, you know, Levittown was an attempt to, to get to overcome uh -huh. monopolies, and that's exactly right. And as I said, they ran, they did run into trouble themselves, you know, mm -hmm. trying to develop their method. They got their method up and running, but then they realized it's cheaper in a factory, and they closed. So, so no, what he talked about, or she, is exactly mm -hmm. right, and very interesting. That's why I may spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, if you go back to the early before World War II, yeah, Sears was do doing a lot, and company Gordon Van Tyne that I mentioned. So they were doing a lot of stuff, um, but they, you know, they were blocked in a lot of ways back then. They were making progress, but you know, it wasn't like uh, clothing or automobiles. I mean, mm -hmm. It didn't just take off the factory, the factory methods because the methods were stopped. And so mm -hmm. yeah, Sears, Sears got out in 46 and exactly, I don't know exactly why they did, but Mm -hmm. Another example, this person says, of uh, prefab lower cost homes would be several homes built near the airport made out of enameled steel, prefab homes made of enameled steel. Do you know anything about those uh, when they were built? Uh, do you know anything about those? No. Do, 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 does a person know how old they are? No. Um, yeah. Says, I don't know the native date of their construction. Yeah, there there were attempts to build um, steel homes, and, and and they and they were sort of successful. Lustrum Homes was the was the big one, um, and so they were out of Cleveland, and they built some homes. Um, they could be Lustrum Homes, um, mm -hmm. and and of course things. They, all these people for so long try to like open up these, and they still do. They 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 try to you know people in California. I mean, Amazon, I think, tried to start a factory production. But anyway, I, I'll look for that. I'll look for that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll look for that sometime. Um, uh, but, but yeah, there was a big company that made steel, Lustrum Steel, Lustrum Homes. Okay. Lustrum. Okay. The next question, what can the average citizen do to have a voice in arguing against monopolies? Thank you for that question. I mean, it's a hard question. I mean... Um, yeah, it's a hard question, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, I'm a little, it's, it's, it's up against, you're up, people are up against a lot of, you know, okay. 
Um, you know, one reason I do this research is hopefully to make some kind of difference. But then I, you know, it just as I say, it's like you explain stuff to people and they're not interested, or um, or they don't that they have an interest in what's going on and. Um, Boy, I, I mean, is my wife Sarah listening? Can you call, call me home with Sarah? My wife's much smarter than I am. I mean, <laughs> all right. Well, we'll give you, know, you no, I mean, a chance. But <laughs> I, I listen to Ralph Nader still on. He's still on the radio, believe it or not. And he always, mm -hmm. with the interview somebody, he always asks that question: What can I do? And I'm like, and I always say, Well, I'm glad I'm not being interviewed by Ralph Nader. So, <laughs> so, yeah. um. I mean, I mean, you know, reading the newspaper and writing letters to the editor. I mean, I wrote an op-ed on affordable housing for, or I mean, factory housing for the Star Tribune, and mm -hmm. um, and you know, there were a lot of letters written to the editor, and I mean, I guess you know, the Star Tribune. That's they work on that basis that they can have an impact, right, by publishing op-eds and having people write letters. And so I think I made contact with a lot of people um, after that op-ed was published, even like developers who sort of agreed with me. Um, so I think that's right. That's one way to, to, to participate. And, 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 uh, mm -hmm. and I think it's true. It's like, you never know. You just, you just gotta do the right thing. So you never know. You just, you just keep pushing, right? And you to, um, so uh, thank you. For that question, and I wish I. Okay. I wish I could. okay. All right. Would you argue that modern tech advances are similar to the housing example you gave, and if so, how are they similar? Um. Well. Again, I say away from, I mean, intellectual property obviously is something that comes up, right? I mean, and, and, and the monopolies in that. And I have a good friend um, who, who's written about that very well. Um, and um, so this is, I mean, I'll say something. I mean, this may mean nothing to the person who asked the question, but, you know, I mean, it, big tech in some ways is a lot of like every other industry that, the people who get out in front have, or first have the have political power, and they use that power to, um, like the patent system, right? I mean, um, software was developed. You know, nobody you took out patents at the first at the start of the software industry, and and then and, you know the patents started coming once, you know, Microsoft and so on and so forth became the leaders, and they used the patent system to block. Um, followers. So I don't know if that does anything for anybody, but, but, uh, um, so I, I, oh, I, sh I should say, I think, I think a lot of these, a lot of industries do follow this pattern that, you know, that like, like the, the, um, the housing industry that, um, they block substitutes. And one thing I haven't really mentioned, which people will have heard this is that they actually, monopolies actually lower productivity in their own industries. So, um, it, and, um, you know, Thurman Arnold said they attack each other, right? People within the monopoly attack each other. And that's because there's a lot of money, let's say there's a lot of money to be made, let's say, right? And so you're competing to see which subgroups are gonna get the money. Well, that's actually how my research started, like in the 90s, showing that that actually is true. Like in a labor union, you'll see like a lot of work rules, which sort of give rights to, to certain people, to certain jobs. And this is sort of protect different groups from each other from trying to take their jobs, but it leads to lower productivity, whatever that's worth. Okay. All right. Next question has to do with Amy Klobuchar's uh, new book, um, which is on the question of monopolies. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Any reactions to that? Well, I looked at it in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I didn't buy it yet. Um, I've got, a, oh man, I got a lot of books I'm going through, but I mean, you know, I'm excited, I'm excited that she's interested in that and doing that. Um, uh -huh. So very excited. It's, it's, it's great. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening about antitrust. Um, Amy Klobuchar and the FTC, what's going on there. So I'm sorry to say, I, that's all I can say is that I'm excited that she's involved and, and, and um, I don't know much more about it. Other than I did look, you know, she's not talking about factory housing. She's not talking about dentists. She's not, she's not talking about these um, things which I think fly under the radar. And, you know, in some sense are more important than, than other ones because it's hurting poor people. And, and like, you know, we want to consider, you know, they're the most important people to be worried about. I mean, um, you know, if I have to pay more for my uh, going to a dentist because, because uh, hygienists can't work on their own, well, I have insurance and what's it gonna, you know, it's not gonna affect me. But if you don't let hygienists work on their own, you're gonna have areas of the state where, you know, there's no dentist there, so not getting, people aren't getting their teeth cleaned. So it doesn't make any sense. Well, why should we worry about the next 15 bucks I have to pay? And we have to worry about there not being services for poor people in a lot of areas. So I might sound like a broken record, but there you go. That's why. I... Um, uh, and the next questioner, you've talked about uh, examples drawn from the housing industry um, and, and dentistry. Um, the next questioner wants to know, are there other current examples that you can name and identify without being sued? <laughs> Um, I'm hoping I can't be sued. <laughs> um, so I appreciate, you know, I appreciate my wife um, allowing me to do this. So, no, I think that's what's great about America, right? I mean, we're, well, it can, it can go too far, but free speech. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think in other countries, actually, you know, but, you know, I could go back to that list. Well, Maybe one or uh, one or two that you'd like to. Well, I mean the mafia. The mafia. I should, well, there you go. I mean, worried about getting sued. Worried about worried about, a, <laughs> worried about a, some flat getting tires. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. Um, um, well, let me go to those five. What, what did I have? Okay, okay. Um, you know, I, I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll just move on. I'll, I'll, here, here, I, I will give. A, I'll give an important one, which, which actually uh -huh. people. If people want to get involved in here, now we're coming back to another question. If people want to get involved in, in these monopolies, it, there's there's trade associations made up of original equipment manufacturers like uh, uh, John Deere and some of the automakers. And what they do is that they formed and they're lobbying to stop the independent repair people. Okay. So they're trying to shut down the industry where you can get your car or so on and so forth repaired someplace other than their dealerships, okay? And there is a group called repair.org who I really, they're great. And so it's repair.org and they are trying to fight this state by state. And in Minnesota, it is gotten to the top of committees and so on and so forth. So somebody, who wants to read a little bit about repair, uh, you know, trying to keep repair open to independent dealers, um, should can read that and write letters to the editor or write to your, write to your legislator. Um, oh, let me just tell you one more thing about the repair stuff. Apple, Apple just made an agreement with Amazon that says you can't sell uh, Apple, you can't sell used uh, refurbished Apple computers over Amazon unless you have $100 million in sales of used Apple computers. And that's new, okay? So, so basically now all these people who would take these Apple computers and sell them for $100 yet to refurbish them are closed out. Um, that's in the Los Angeles Times. Okay, and there was a guy from Minnesota who was a big part of that story. I forget, I don't know. Okay, I'm done, yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, Question, what was HUD's motivation to subsidize traditional homes? Um, they basically were traditional home builders, the people who were in charge of HUD at that time. Um, and so um, 
And a lot of them went to jail uh, following that. Uh, well, well, they were went to jail for lots of things. HUD has been like the ver very, very corrupt organization for a very long time, but that's basically it. They were, um, they may be on leave for five years or a few years, but they were traditional home builders. And mm -hmm. to read about who was involved with that, um, even now, this is the 1970s, what's well, a who's who of like, well, I can't use bad language. Um, well, there's people in the news now. Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop. You, yeah. You're done? Yeah, yeah, okay. that's, that's, that's the motivation. They were builders. Home all builders. right, all right, okay. Questioner wants to know, are think tanks monopolies? They seem to have the same groups of academics that move from one to another within their political area. Some are conservative, some centrist, some are progressive. Um, I guess, you know, I guess um, I can see there, they, they, they certainly, have become uh, insulated or, or inbred. That's, maybe that's a better word. But I think there is. Well, and again, there, there is. There's a lot that open up. But again, I don't know much about. You know, like Brookings. I mean, I don't, maybe maybe you just can't hope to get any leverage with, with the press if um, you're not one of these people. So they they could they could in some sense, be very close to selling the sole seller of a certain product. They, they could. I just don't know enough about that. I mean, I know, um, you know, I know, I know people don't, you know, and I always don't want to think about monopolies differently because they've used the old way to think about it. So, I mean, Judy, your husband's in uh, <laughs> acad academia. No, I'm just saying that's well known in academia. Like, you just, I mean, you, you, know, you know, people... People have vested interests in in what they know in the old ways, right? And so, and that's okay. I mean, that's the way the world works. But the question is like how, how you take it beyond certain points. And, and so, yeah, yeah. I, I think we'll move forward. <clears throat> Here's a question that I think inadvertently ended up in the Q and A column, but I can answer it. Um, this questioner says, "I have no audio for this section." Um, uh, can you provide the audio? Well, I don't know if we were able to restore his audio, but I do want to say to anyone listening, if you had problems with the audio or visual on this uh, broadcast, this broadcast it will be recorded and posted to our website. So you will have a chance to listen to the whole thing later. I'm sorry that's not a perfect answer, but I hope that helps. All right, moving straight on, because we're almost out of time here. Does the fact that Facebook and Google provide services to customers at no charge. Does that fact exempt them from antitrust action? Um, well, here's another admission. Here's another admission. I mean, it doesn't because in, in the sense that there's antitrust cases being brought against them now, and I forget exactly why, but again, I'm, you know, I guess it's pretty bad to admit this, but I'm going to. I mean, I don't know much about the antitrust laws. I mean, I'm interested in knowing what a monopoly is. I mean, then you know, after I figure that out, you know, then you make the antitrust laws. I mean, again, that's talking from an academic point of view. Of course, you have to be involved um, in the current time, but I, I'm more like a Henry Simons. Like I'm, you know, well, I, I want to know what a monopoly is, and then then I can talk about antitrust. So I do know a little bit, but I'm not, I mean, and you know, it's, it's like the Sherman Act was the first act and people keep referring back to what did, Sher you know, this act and they talk about what did Sherman mean when he wrote this? And I'm always like, well, I didn't, I mean, who the hell is Sherman? I mean, he's, he's not Thomas Jefferson, right? I mean, sometimes we can, I, I don't think, you know, we can go back and ask apologies to maybe his relatives, but why are we like, and of course, I know why we're doing that, right? Because antitrust lawyers, that's all their skill is in, in making like cases around the Sherman Act. So they don't want to change their, what antitrust is, but it's, it's, it's a very, antitrust, well, it's, antitrust is a very um, 
well, it's just, there's, there's monopolies in antitrust. I mean, I've got that written in some of my uh, papers. I mean, there's some bad things happening in antitrust, uh, just not just among the people who are engaged in it. We have a couple of questions dealing with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, one questioner points out that they have the largest number of lobbyists in Washington. And uh, another questioner says, Medicare is legally prohibited from negotiating drug prices. Is this a good example of monopoly influence? What sort of monopoly influence does the pharmaceutical uh, industry exert? Well, I mean, I guess they, they get it through, you know, through contribute through, they get it through uh, political power and, and, and confusion. Okay, um, so I mean, you know, insulin is ex, you know is extremely costly, and people die for not having insulin. We know that that happened to people in Minnesota, and so. But that's another thing monopolies do. They make things very, very, very confusing, and so it's hard to track down what they're doing. So. I was contacted by somebody from the Insulin Project and he wanted to work. You know, I was, I mean, at one point, maybe two years ago, I said, okay, this year I'm just going to spend the whole year trying to figure out what's going on with insulin. Okay. And I started, but then I said, no, okay, I, I, I got to finish what I was start, I had done before. But I mean, it, it, they, they have all these different ways to, um, and so they'll, they'll get laws passed, which, Nobody really knows, you know, the intent, and they have, you know, they 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 do things that are very tricky, and you wind up, they wind up. Uh, I'm sorry, that's all I can say, but I want to add that, you know, it, it's 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 monopoly, and one of the one of the very powerful methods is confusion uh, and misinformation, um, because it, like in the build the housing industry. Factory housing, there's this language that's so archaic, how they call different houses and stuff. And I was like completely confused by it. And so I said, I'm not gonna use any language from this industry. I'm gonna make my own language up because it was too confusing and, and, and it was on purpose, I'm sure. Um, so. Okay, well, we're just about out of time, but I want to mention that your wife has been heard from on okay. the chat line. Right. And she reminds you to talk uh, about uh, government watchdogs as uh, the best way to block monopolies. Absolutely, absolutely. That's <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think, no, I mean, thank you, Sarah. I mean, and then I think, you know, that's, I should mention the other thing, like people sometimes they, they'll see that the government is helping a private industry become a monopoly, right? Um, so like with HUD and the housing industry. So they say, oh, we got to get government out of the economy. That is not the conclusion to draw. The conclusion is we need the government. Henry Simon says, I, I'm, a, I'm a libertarian, but I want to make sure that my government is stronger than my businesses, my monopolies. So you got to get them down, right? So, but if you try to do that, of course, the government's going to, you know, there will be, there'll be industries that take over their the government's attempt to get rid of them. And I mean, it's a complicated world. So uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> well, and thank you, uh, Jim Schmitz. Uh, we're out of time. I want to thank um, our speaker, Jim Schmitz. I want to especially thank uh, Cody uh, Grimsley behind the scenes, who did such a great job with the PowerPoint presentation. I want to thank the audience. Uh, great questions. And I'm so sorry that I didn't get uh, to all of them because they were all excellent. I hope that you will all come back um, next week when we will welcome Dr. Yelena ba Bailey, who will talk about how the streets were made, housing segregation and black life in America. We look forward to seeing you then. But for now, for today, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you.